In the late 1980s, the pop culture landscape was changed forever following the debut of Star Trek The Next Generation. By its third season, the show had proven its detractors wrong by becoming a new definitive incarnation of the Star Trek franchise, which had previously been defined by the iconic trio of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. The success of The Next Generation proved Star Trek could move beyond its foundations, and paved the way for future spin-offs Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the full slate of modern shows we enjoy today. In the early 90s, science fiction television was dominated by this single brand, the adventures of the crew of the USS Enterprise going boldly where no one has gone before, exploring strange new worlds and encountering strange new life, was what defined the genre on the small screen for many people, and there was seemingly no room for anything else. That is, until an unlikely but ambitious challenger stepped up to prove this assumption wrong. The year was 1993, and the name of the show was Babylon 5. Joseph Michael Straczynski was born in Patterson, New Jersey, 1954. His ancestry was a mix of Polish and Russian, his grandparents having fled to America during the Russian Revolution. By his own accounts in his incredible and searingly honest autobiography, Straczynski's childhood was not a happy one. His father, whom he refers to as a drunken, abusive, and violent conman, had the family constantly on the move to avoid law enforcement and loan sharks. As somewhat of an escape from this dark early chapter in his life, Straczynski became an avid reader of science fiction and comic books, particularly Superman. In his teenage years, after escaping his dysfunctional home, he attended San Diego State University where he tried to make his start as a writer. He penned several plays and contributed pieces to the campus's student newspaper. While at the newspaper, Straczynski acquired a reputation for writing impressively fast and often. In fact, he contributed so many articles to the paper, for a time the publication was nicknamed The Daily Joe. After graduating with a double major in sociology and psychology, with minors in philosophy and literature, he used his skills as a writer to find work in a wide range of fields, such as radio, newspapers, and he also wrote three novels. He eventually found work writing for animated shows, such as He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, as well as the real Ghostbusters. Being familiar with animation led him to work on the series Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future, which featured the pioneering use of computer-generated animation. Initially, Straczynski was only hired as a member of the writer's room, but over the course of production, he became the de facto head writer for the series. It was an incredibly ambitious show for its time. It sought to appeal to adults as well as children, featuring a healthy amount of action while also telling a dark and mature story. The show was also heavily pushed in merchandising, with a line of action figures and television games by Mattel. Although well received and enjoyed by a small fanbase, the show seemed destined for cult status only. The comic book-esque title turned away adult viewers who assumed it was a children's show, and many at the network deemed it too dark for kids. It was also an extremely expensive show to produce, an expense which wasn't justified due to its low ratings. Therefore, it was cancelled after only one season. While Straczynski's first stint as a major creative force behind a live-action show had ultimately ended in failure, it did provide Straczynski with some valuable lessons with regards to the practicality of running a science fiction TV show. It also connected Straczynski to producers John Copeland and Douglas Netter. The two of them were keen on working with Straczynski on another show, and as it turned out, Straczynski had the perfect pitch for them. In truth, the concept which would become Babylon 5 started as two different ideas. Being a fan of grand space opera novel series such as E.E. E. Smith's Lensman and Isaac Asimov's Foundation, Straczynski for a long time envisioned creating a science fiction television novel, a single grand story rich in scope and characters depicting the rise and fall of empires, which would be told over multiple seasons. 
Simultaneously, he envisioned a much smaller scale science fiction drama, set aboard a space station as opposed to a travelling starship. Having worked on Captain Power and other shows which frequently went over budget, Straczynski took a leaf from more mainstream shows like medical dramas and police procedurals, which usually relied on a single location. Therefore, a science fiction show confined to a single space station could be responsibly produced and not go over budget while still telling great stories. The ideas had been rolling around in Straczynski's head for quite some time. He recalled, Once I had the locale, I began to populate it with characters, and sketch out directions that might be interesting. I dragged out my notes on religion, philosophy, history, sociology, psychology, science, the ones that didn't make my head explode, and started stitching together a crazy quilt pattern that eventually formed a picture. Once I had that picture in my head, once I knew what the major theme was, the rest fell into place. All at once, I saw the full five-year story in a flash, and I frantically began scribbling down notes. All throughout his work on Captain Power, Straczynski was refining a series bible for his idea. He set a number of goals for Babylon 5, saying, The show would have to be good science fiction. It would also have to be good television. And rarely are SF shows both good SF and good TV. They're generally one or the other. It would have to do for science fiction television what Hill Street Blues had done for police dramas, by taking an adult approach to the subject. It would have to be reasonably budgeted, and it would have to look unlike anything ever seen before on TV, presenting individual stories against a much broader canvas. It had to take science fiction seriously, to build characters for grown-ups, to incorporate real science, but keep the characters at the centre of the story. The show would have no kids or cute robots. The idea was not to present a perfect utopian future, but one with greed and homelessness, one where characters grow, develop, live and die. One where not everything was the same at the end of the day's events. As Captain Power's cancellation approached, Straczynski showed the series Bible to Netter and Copeland, who were extremely impressed with the material. With the series Bible in hand, they sought to find a home for the series. After shopping the project around for almost five years, they eventually took it to Warner Brothers, which at the time was looking for programming for their new primetime entertainment network, and Babylon 5 looked as though it could be their new network's flagship show. That being said, the Warner Brothers executives had a number of concerns. Firstly, that American viewer attention spans would be unable to keep up with a long-running narrative. Secondly, that if the show went into syndication, the episodes might be broadcast out of order. And thirdly, no other science fiction series outside of the juggernaut which was Star Trek had ever lasted beyond three seasons. However, despite all of these concerns, Executive producer Dick Robertson at Warner Brothers believed in the strength of the story, and eventually a pilot was greenlit. Making up the main cast of this new show would be a diverse ensemble of aliens and humans. For the role of the station's first officer, Laurel Takashima, Tamlin Tamita was cast. Tamita broke into acting following an appearance in The Karate Kid 2, and starred in independent films such as Come See the Paradise and The Joy Luck Club. She also landed several guest spots in network TV shows before and after Babylon 5 in police procedurals, medical dramas, and is no stranger to sci-fi appearing in Quantum Leap, Stargate SG-1, and much later the first season of Star Trek Picard. For the station's chief doctor, Benjamin Kyle, veteran of stage and screen Johnny Secker was cast. He had served in the British Royal Air Force in the 1950s before pursuing acting, landing a number of stage roles and bit parts in movies. He found success in the USA with roles in the sitcom Good Times and the movie Muhammad, Messenger of God. Playing the show's first on-screen telepath, Lita Alexander, was Patricia Talman. Talman worked throughout the 80s and 90s as both an actress and as a stunt performer, appearing in George A. Romero films such as Knight Riders and Creepshow 2. She also portrayed a possessed witch in Sam Raimi's Army of Darkness. In the Star Trek franchise, she acted as either an extra or stunt performer across 50 episodes of the various shows. The same year she worked on Babylon 5, she also played Laura Dern's stunt double in Jurassic Park. Playing one of Babylon 5's principal alien characters was Mira Furlon as Delenn. Delenn was originally meant to be a male character portrayed by a female actress 
to facilitate a planned change when Delenn would later transform into a female. Therefore, the makeup design for Delenn was far more masculine. However, the effect used to deepen Furlon's voice never properly worked, and so Delenn and the Mimbari species as a whole were then envisioned as an androgynous people. The more masculine makeup remained, but Mira Furlon's voice was left unaltered. Furlon got her start in acting with the Croatian National Theatre Group in Zagreb. She landed regular roles on Yugoslavian television and went on to appear in the acclaimed film When My Father Was Away on Business. However, when her native Yugoslavia fell into a series of wars, she was forced to flee to the United States, where she became a member of the Actors Studio in New York and continued to perform regularly on stage before landing her role on Babylon 5. To play the station's security chief Michael Garibaldi, Jerry Doyle won the role. Doyle's career as an actor began quite late compared to his co-stars. He had previously worked as a corporate jet pilot and as a stockbroker before making an abrupt career change into acting. He landed recurring roles on Moonlighting and The Bold and the Beautiful before securing his first starring role on Babylon 5. A good friend to Michael Garibaldi on Babylon 5 would be Londo Malari, played by Peter Jurisic. Jurisic had been working steadily as a guest in several TV shows, including MacGyver and MASH, but his biggest claim to fame before Babylon 5 was as a semi-regular on Hill Street Blues. Londo's main adversary for the show would be Jacar of the Narn, played by Andreas Katsoulas. Katsoulas got his start as part of the Peter Brooks International Theatre Company before breaking into television and film. He famously played the villain of Frederick Sykes opposite Harrison Ford in The Fugitive, and as the recurring villain Romulan commander Tamalok in Star Trek The Next Generation. To play the station's commander Geoffrey St. Clair, Michael O'Hare won the role. Robert Michael O'Hare seemed at first to have a promising career as a professional football player, a sport he picked up to help overcome his childhood asthma, but found a love of acting while attending Harvard University. He led an acclaimed career acting on Broadway while also appearing in guest roles on T.J. Hooker, The Equalizer, and Tales from the Dark Side before becoming the lead in Babylon 5. Filming of Babylon 5's pilot movie The Gathering began in late 1992, filmed entirely on sets built not at Warner Brothers Studios, but instead in Sun Valley, California, inside an old factory which used to make hot tubs. A cost-saving measure for the production was in designing sets which could pull double or even triple duty as other locations. Production designer John Iacovelli and J. Michael Straczynski drew on their experiences in theatre to create sets which could be transformed into others within less than an hour. In total, the production used 16 standing sets, which could almost all be redressed as others. Straczynski also worked with the makeup effects artist John Criswell to create the numerous alien designs for the series. While the Minbari having boneheads, Narn being reptilian amphibian looking marsupials, and the Vorlons wearing the encounter suits were all ideas which came from Straczynski, the genesis of the famous Centauri hairstyle originated from Peter Jurisic. It was also Jurisic who came up with Londo's trademark accent. Though depending on who tells the story, there exists an anecdote of Jurisic coming up with the hairstyle as a joke, which Straczynski took seriously. By the time the two figured out they were both kidding, the peacock-like ruff was already an iconic Centauri look. In contrast to most other film and television productions which even to this day shoot for extremely long days, sometimes up to 18 hours, producer Douglas Netter was insistent on a hard 7.30pm wrap time. Rather than this hard deadline making the shooting schedule even tighter, instead the opposite effect occurred. Everything was just out of love, you know, people were finding a way to make this happen. By the second or third day, things were going so well, and everyone was having such a great time, it was like we'd been shooting together for a year. As Jerry Doyle described, Netter ran the show like a tight ship. The amount of pages needing to be shot each day was ambitious, but easily achievable thanks to careful planning and consummate professionalism. Also in contrast to other sci-fi shows of the day was the choice to use CGI and other digital tools for the show's visual effects. Star Trek The Next Generation had toyed with using the same idea back in the late 80s, 
but eventually opted to use the tried-and-true motion-controlled miniature effects pioneered by industrial light and magic. Although the results of these methods were usually of a high calibre, the process was an expensive and time-consuming one. Babylon 5 was a more modestly budgeted show and couldn't afford to produce its visual effects in the same way. Therefore, the production enlisted the help of foundation imaging to create the spaceships, space backgrounds, and the station itself with CGI. This strive to be on the cutting edge of technology also extended to the editing process as well. Rather than the cumbersome process of cutting negative, Babylon 5 used a fully digital editing suite to assemble episodes. To create the music for the pilot, the production enlisted Stuart Copeland of The Police to write the score. After a fast-paced production which saw the team pushing the technological envelope to finish on time and within budget, the first episode of Babylon 5 debuted on PTEN on the 22nd of February, 1993. Contrary to many other sci-fi franchises, the first episode of Babylon 5 is often overlooked by many fans. While it was the debut of the show, it also features a lot of elements which were drastically changed between the pilot and the actual series. Presentation-wise, the gathering is certainly visually distinct, but in terms of production value, it definitely shows its age, particularly with the visual effects. I think the problem is more to do with the overall direction of the virtual sequences. The camera movements are eerily precise and functional. Virtual cameras worry new technology at the time, after all, and so while the visual effects work overall, they lack the sense of artistry and craft which would later be seen in the actual series. That being said, I think the overall visual feel of this first film is a lot more dynamic than the rest of the series. Lots of coloured lighting diffusing through some inexplicable fog, in some places it almost comes off like an early Tony or Ridley Scott flick. The production design is a little more mixed though. There are some elements I like, such as the breathing masks and the big PPG rifles, but then there's these really bulky harnesses in the train cars. The dialogue scenes with these just feel really awkward and I'm glad they were taken out later. The drive for that 90s music video aesthetic also leads to some weird stuff such as the constantly pulsing lights in the station's lifts. It's a bit odd. The makeup effects work is also a lot more inconsistent. Many of the background aliens come off as a bit cheap. The cast in general are all very good. Michael O'Hare makes a solid impression as a firm but kind and wise leader. Visually, he fits the bill as the traditional chisel-jawed space hero, but with none of the jingoism or ego. Instead, he's far more tempered than one may expect, and this interesting mix of demeanour and appearance makes him quite a compelling lead. Jerry Doyle emerges fully formed on screen as Garibaldi. He comes across as a character plucked right out of a modern-day cop show and dropped into an epic space opera. But it's his fast-talking, wise-cracking, salt-of-the-earth style which really helps characterise this setting as definitely not the near-utopia audiences would be more accustomed to from the likes of Star Trek. Jakar, Londo, and Delenn are probably the most different in this pilot compared to the characters most fans know and love. Jakar is effectively villainous and conniving, while also being pompous and camp. Londo in this first episode is almost played as completely comic relief. And Delenn is mysterious, ruthless, and sly. Takashima, Lita, and Dr. Kyle are solid members of the ensemble, but don't get as much to do compared with the others, especially Dr. Kyle. That's not to say the character is poorly written or performed, he just doesn't get those same moments of interesting dialogue or decisive action which Takashima and Lita do. The central plot for this first outing is quite gripping with an assassination plot against Vorlon Ambassador Kosh, leading to Sinclair's framing and trial, and spiralling into a Vorlon fleet on the brink of wiping out the station. It starts things slow with effective intrigue filled with plenty of twists and turns, and then rapidly ratchets up the stakes for the finale. Initially, the pace is quite slow, with many scenes having to work in exposition about the various races and the wider history of the universe. While a lot of this exposition does come across as a bit clunky, that's to be expected from a pilot episode. The second half, which reveals Sinclair's innocence and showcases the impending Vorlon attack, packs in plenty of good action and tension. It feels like a rewarding payoff to the viewer as all the plot threads and character arcs neatly resolve. That being said, there are enough dangling threads which foreshadow the potential of the show's stories. In terms of a showcase of what Babylon 5 later becomes, The Gathering is a decent, contained adventure. It succeeds in establishing the station as the focal point of a larger, epic narrative, and populates it with a strong ensemble. 
thanks to Warner Brothers marketing The Gathering as event television for their new network, and some savvy early online marketing from Straczynski, Babylon 5's pilot was a hit, bringing in 9.7 million viewers, and positive overall reviews from critics and audiences. It also took home an Emmy Award for its visual effects. While the show still required some fine-tuning, it was given the go-ahead for its first season. While The Gathering was a success, it took over a full year for Babylon 5 to begin its first season, and unfortunately not all of the cast could return. Between the end of the pilot and the green light for the first season, Tamlin Tamita had decided to pursue other career goals rather than playing a military character on a science fiction show, and so declined the offer to sign on for the first season. Johnny Saka was unfortunately in ill health toward the end of production on The Gathering, and likewise couldn't commit to the first season. Patricia Tolman also ran into scheduling conflicts. Rather than simply recast any of the roles, Straczynski decided to create new characters and keep Takashima and Dr. Kyle within the continuity of the series. During the in-universe one-year gap between the station coming online and the events of Season 1, it's assumed Takashima and Kyle were simply reassigned. In their place, Straczynski created the characters Susan Ivanova, Dr. Stephen Franklin, and Talia Winters. Ivanova was played by Claudia Christian. Christian made her debut on television in a small role on Dallas and continued to land guest roles on shows such as Quantum Leap and Murder, She Wrote, before becoming a series regular on Behringer's. She also made several film appearances in Clean and Sober, Never on Tuesday, and The Hidden before joining Babylon 5. Dr. Stephen Franklin was played by Richard Biggs. After cutting his teeth in theatre, regularly performing Shakespeare, Biggs landed a role in the soap opera Days of Our Lives, which he acted in for seven years before joining Babylon 5. Replacing Lita Alexander as the station's resident telepath was Talia Winters, played by Andrea Thompson. Thompson made an impression on audiences as the scheming Janiel Erickson in the final season of soap opera Falcon Crest. She also had a guest role in Quantum Leap and had appeared in several films before Babylon 5. Also joining the cast in season 1 were the recurring characters Veer, played by Stephen First, and Lanier, played by Bill Mummy. Stephen First gained recognition for his comedic performance in National Lampoon's Animal House before becoming a regular on Saint Elsewhere. Bill Mummy had been acting since he was only six years old, having appeared in The Twilight Zone, Alfred Hitchcock's Presents, and most famously as Will Robinson in Lost in Space. While the production of season one managed to hold on to most of the crew from The Gathering, there were two exceptions. Makeup effects artist John Criswell was unavailable for the first season, and so he was replaced by John Vulich. Vulich worked with Straczynski to refine some of the alien designs, making the Narns less angular, the Minbari no longer androgynous, and also getting rid of the less successful background alien designs. Straczynski and the producers were unsatisfied with Stuart Copeland's music, and so for the series they hired composer Christopher Frankie. Being a former member of the group Tangerine Dream, Frankie was a pioneer in using electronically synthesized instruments for his scores, having previously experimented with the techniques in Roland Emmerich's Universal Soldier. Once again using the cutting-edge technology of the day, the work of creating the music was split between the US and Germany using the internet. Frankie would remain in California while conducting the Berlin Symphonic Orchestra for the acoustic components of each track. The files would then be sent over to Frankie through the internet, where he would then assemble and mix the tracks together. Christopher is an interesting person to work with in that he is completely flat affect. You say to him, Chris, I need this huge monstrous score over here, just big, 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 yes, I will do this, you know, and walk away and come back with this incredible composition. Maybe it's the German and Christopher, but if he tells you he's going to deliver on a certain date, he will deliver it on a certain date. I love the deadlines. Without deadlines, I would be lost. When something really melts together on picture and sound becomes like one unity, then I know I'm done. Chris is one of these indomitably cheerful, nothing is a problem kind of people. This is another indication of the, the, the kind of guy that Christopher is. He is quite remarkable. 
Season 1 of Babylon 5 is a solid inaugural year for the series, but it's also evident the show is still finding its feet. Caught between the vision of its creator and the conventional wisdom of the studio executives overseeing the production, Babylon 5's first season is mostly made up of episodic sci-fi adventures. But this familiar format helps make the big departures from the expectations of the day all the more impactful. There's a healthy mix of political intrigue stories driven by the characters, such as Midnight on the Firing Line, and fun pulpy slices of action-adventure like Infection. Featuring more flawed and nuanced characters means even the weakest episodes of the season have something to enjoy from a character perspective. Sinclair and Garibaldi continue to be strong, with Londo, Jacquard and Delenn solidifying into the characters fans came to know and love. In a way, the healthy balance of standalone episodes and foreshadowing arc-heavy installments makes season one quite rewarding to watch in retrospect. Seemingly innocuous elements from the B-plots of one-off stories come back sometimes two years later and reveal themselves as crucial to the grander narrative of Babylon 5. The more overtly signposted arc for the season, though, concerns Commander Sinclair and the time he can't account for during the Battle of the Line. This is a story arc which unfortunately wasn't able to go in the direction J. Michael Straczynski originally envisioned, for reasons we'll get into later. However, that doesn't mean the arc is unfinished, or all this setup goes to waste. What it does do is raise a number of questions for the viewer about specific characters and the status quo of the established universe. Delenn and the Mimbari, while presented as wise sages and disciplined warriors, also carry an air of suspicion about them. Did they end the war with humanity out of a sense of altruism, or is there something more nefarious at play? Does Delenn really care about Sinclair as a person, or merely as an asset? Is Delenn a valuable ally, or a secret villain? It's a story thread which adds a lot of subtext to Sinclair's scenes with Delenn and the Mimbari, and overall is quite a compelling mystery. Other seemingly standalone episodes succeed in telling good stories, but also work to set Babylon 5 wholly apart from the more pop-culturally dominant Star Trek. The first of these is Mind War, which is the first real episode dedicated to exploring the psy -core. The history of telepaths on Earth and the presence of the psy -core adds a lot of nuance to the world-building and characters of the series. While the viewer is predisposed to naturally seeing Earth Force and humanity as the quote-unquote good guys, the psy -core puts all of that into question. The plight of telepaths being forced into joining an authoritarian organization with Orwellian overtones just because of how they were born is truly a sympathetic one. However, the inherent mistrust of telepaths and the hysteria which created the psy -core is also understandable. It's not a strictly black and white subject and allows stories surrounding the psy -core to explore more interesting territory rather than potentially falling back on the blunt and or clumsy racism metaphor it could have been. Mind War sees a former lover of Talia Winters, Jason Ironheart, fleeing to the station while on the run from Psycop Alfred Bester, played to excellence by Star Trek's Walter Koenig. The character was lovingly named after the author Alfred Bester, who wrote the novel The Demolished Man, a story which depicts a society rife with telepaths, organised in a virtually identical setup to the psy in Babylon 5. In truth, Koenig's Alfred Bester makes his best appearances later on in the show, but in Mind War we get to see flashes of the smarmy demeanour and ends justify the means philosophy, as well as verbal or rather mental clashes with Michael Garibaldi, which would come to solidify the character as a fan favourite. Just 50 quarters to search. Good. That should help narrow it down. Anatomically impossible, Mr. Garibaldi. You're welcome to try. It's a character Koenig loved to play, far richer than his more famous Pavel Chekhov. While legally the main characters aboard Babylon 5 are on the same side as Bester during his hunt for Ironheart, morally they are totally opposed. This leads to an engrossing dynamic between the characters, as both sides are engaged in a battle of wits as they navigate the labyrinth of legality and regulation to produce their desired outcome without compromising their own positions. It fills the hunt for Ironheart with tension and thrills, while the episode also fascinates us with its themes surrounding transhumanism. At first glance, it's a standard police procedural with a sci-fi twist, but the heavy lifting it does in developing the characters and exploring the wider universe is incredibly impressive. The second episode of this variety I wanted to highlight is the often overlooked Believers. Once again, it appears as though this episode exists to hammer home to the audience that this is not the familiar Star Trek formula with a new look of paint. 
Dr. Franklin supervises the condition of a young boy, Sean. He states the terminal illness threatening Sean's life can be cured with a simple operation. However, the boy's parents strongly object on religious grounds. It's fitting the episode was written by David Gerald, a Star Trek veteran, as this setup feels like something lifted right out of Star Trek The Next Generation. And it's easy for the audience to assume they know how events will play out. However, rather than the story framing the parents as backwards religious fanatics who need to be taught a lesson by the more scientifically knowledgeable Dr. Franklin, the theme being explored for the most part is more about tolerance. Whether Franklin or Sinclair have the right to supersede the beliefs of another culture when those beliefs conflict with their own. Nevertheless, the predictable plot of Franklin going rogue to perform the operation anyway, and the parents seemingly learning to accept the outcome, fits the expected formula, even if well executed. That is until Dr. Franklin discovers the parents' real intentions, and were met with the truly shocking ending where Sean is ritually murdered by his own mother and father. Rather than a filler episode which conveys a simplistic moral lesson, Believers ends with no one really being in the right, and what exactly constitutes being right in this specific situation is left for the audience to decide. While Mind War and Believers are strong examples of the above average standalone episodes in season 1, the biggest indicator that there is something else afoot is clearly shown in the pivotal signs and portents. At first glance, Signs and Portents is merely the payoff to the Raiders plot, stock bad guys whenever an episode needed to inject some action into the story. And while they serve the same purpose here, escalating into a large-scale dogfight outside the station, the real meat of the episode deals with a stranger who visits Babylon 5 named Mr. Morden. With no indication as to who he represents or who gave him authorization, he visits each ambassador on the station, cryptically asking the question, what do you want? For much of the episode, the viewer is kept off balance by these seemingly separate plot lines running in parallel. We follow the station command staff combating the raiders as they've done many times before, but the scenes following Morden intrigue and unsettle. Ed Wasser, who previously appeared as an unnamed technician in The Gathering, makes a real impression as Mr. Morden. Dressed in a sharp suit and brandishing a bright smile, but always with a sense of something sinister and dark bubbling beneath the surface. He comes across like a character from folklore, someone who will promise you the world, but with dire unforeseen consequences. But it's the ending of the episode which makes the biggest statement about Babylon 5 as a show going forward. After the raiders are revealed as part of a scheme hatched by Lord Kiro to usurp the Centauri throne, the sudden betrayal by the raiders leads us into the expected episode wrap-up. The viewer feels as if they can relax, confident in all apparent loose ends being tied off, until... What the hell? This is where Babylon 5 finally shows its hand to the viewer. This is not a series of interconnected plots, but a large web of stories and characters all being drawn to a single conclusion. What exactly that conclusion is, however, remains to be seen. The ramifications of signs and portents is also what makes the later Babylon Squared much more palatable. When the long-lost Babylon 4 reappears in Sector 14, Sinclair and Garibaldi go to investigate, finding the original crew having been plucked out of time and driven partially mad by flashes of their possible futures and established pasts. Compounding the mystery is a bizarre alien called Zathras who apparently knows who Sinclair is. It's a truly strange episode which throws a never-ending stream of questions at the characters and the viewer. Although Garibaldi and Sinclair succeed with their rescue mission, all of the major questions brought up go unanswered. It's a real gamble for a show which wasn't necessarily guaranteed a second season, but thanks to the precedent set by Signs and Portents, the audience is left confident that the mystery will one day be solved. A further precedent for the show is set by the first season's two-parter, A Voice in the Wilderness. During a routine survey of Epsilon 3, the planet Babylon 5 orbits, an advanced intelligence is suddenly revealed as hiding beneath the surface. This prompts the rampant curiosity of the various ambassadors, arrival of an Earth Force cruiser, and the return of an ancient alien race laying claim to the great machine inside the planet. 
As well as being a thoroughly enjoyable slice of sci-fi action adventure packed with ancient alien booby traps, space battles and compelling character arcs, A Voice in the Wilderness sets a precedent that the assumed status quo of the series is always up for potential change. Epsilon 3 up until this point was simply a background detail, an anonymous barren rock to add texture to the space vistas. It's representative of the show's larger ethos, if something so apparently inconsequential can hide such a big secret, what else could be lurking in the unexplored corners of the galaxy? Both of these precedents then collide in the season finale, Chrysalis. While Garibaldi races to uncover an assassination plot, Delenn carries a cryptic message for Sinclair, and Londo's newfound alliance with Mr. Morden takes him down a dark path. There's almost a feeling of inevitability with this final episode, as if the characters are caught up in events which, once set in motion, cannot be undone. The simmering conflict between the Narn and the Centauri finally boils over with Londo using his alliance with Mr. Morden to launch a devastating attack on a Narn outpost. Sinclair has never been closer to finding out what happened to him at the Battle of the Line, but his duties keep him from the answers he's been searching for all season. But most impactful is Garibaldi's failure to stop the assassination plot, which sees the Earth Alliance's president killed over Io. As season one comes to an end, the station stands at a crossroads. The lingering plot threads and tantalizing mysteries which grip the viewer may never have been resolved had Babylon 5's first year not made waves. Thankfully though, it did. Season 1 of Babylon 5 was a hit for the Primetime Entertainment Network, and its ambitious storytelling had earned it some critical praise as well as another Emmy win. Season 2 was given the go-ahead, but the show's second year would see some major changes. Before production of Babylon 5's second season could begin, J. Michael Straczynski was met by Michael O'Hare to discuss the actor's sudden departure from the series. Unbeknownst to the rest of the cast and crew, O'Hare had been suffering from schizophrenia throughout the first season, and while he had been able to manage his condition initially, halfway through filming that year, his condition suddenly worsened, leading to erratic behaviour and bouts of paranoid delusions. Straczynski and O'Hare had become close friends by this point, and so Straczynski offered to suspend filming for a few months while O'Hare sought treatment. O'Hare, however, didn't want to risk jeopardising a second season and risking his colleagues' jobs. Thus, he decided to leave the show. Upon his departure, O'Hare asked Straczynski to keep the real reason for his leaving a secret. Straczynski told the actor, I'll take the secret to my grave. To which O'Hare responded, How about to my grave? a request Straczynski honoured for the remainder of the actor's life. Straczynski only revealed this following Michael O'Hare's tragic death in 2012 at the age of 60. As with the changing cast members between The Gathering and Season 1, Straczynski chose not to recast Sinclair, but replace him with a new character. Captain John Sheridan was the result, played by Bruce Boxleitner. Boxleitner found early success in his television career, landing lead roles in How the West Was Won, Bring Him Back Alive, and Scarecrow and Mrs. King. He had previously made a foray into science fiction playing the titular character in Tron, which also featured Peter Jurisic in a small role. Despite the abrupt change in leads, Boxleitner ingratiated himself to the cast and crew, becoming fast friends with Claudia Christian among others. Also joining the cast was Robert Russler as Warren Keffer. Keffer was created out of a studio note, with Warner Brothers asking Straczynski to create a hotshot pilot character. Straczynski never really liked the archetype, but obliged anyway with plans to kill off the character by the end of season two. Another recurring role was Zach Allen, played by Jeff Conaway, known for playing Kinnicky in the musical Grease and Bobby Wheeler in the sitcom Taxi. Season 2 of Babylon 5 is an overall improvement over its first. The plans for a larger narrative were more clearly on display, and the quality of standalone episodes continues to be strong. The production in general feels much more confident, the sign of a crew now far more accustomed to the experimental filmmaking techniques they had implemented the previous year. This newfound confidence is on clear display in the season's first episode, Points of Departure. It almost serves as a second pilot for the show, and I've used it myself to introduce friends to the series. 
Ivanova catching Sheridan up on all the recent events showcases to the fans how the status quo has been changed, but also allows potential newcomers to get to grips with the setting and characters. It also lets Boxleitner and Straczynski illustrate how different Sheridan is compared to Sinclair. While Sinclair was the diplomat and poet, Sheridan is a jarhead, a soldier, an all-American, chisel-jawed space hero who socks bad guys on the jaw and hits home runs in his spare time. In some respects, the character is in danger of falling into a tired stereotype, but Boxleitner's emotional sincerity, the character's passionate drive, and a number of fun eccentricities in the character makes him quite an endearing lead. In fact, he was nicknamed Captain Smiley by Claudia Christian and Jerry Doyle. The episode also illustrates the stark difference between Sinclair and Sheridan when it comes to handling diplomacy. Whereas Sinclair was thoughtful and considerate, Sheridan is blunt and aggressive. While his passionate drive makes him a compelling lead to watch, it can also have him stumbling headfirst into volatile situations and making extreme gambles which could utterly destroy his position and even his life if things don't go his way. Ultimately, Points of Departure is startlingly impressive for an episode which had to introduce a new lead without turning off viewers, get potential newcomers up to speed, and continue the plot lines the series had already started. The revelation of Minbari souls being born in human bodies, no doubt meant for Sinclair to hear originally, still manages to satisfy despite the rushed delivery. Overall, it's a strong opener to the second season. The episodes following Points of Departure offer a healthy mix of standalone adventures and tantalising glimpses of the larger narrative. Almost as a direct follow-up to the gripping spider in the web, a race through dark places sees Alfred Bester return to the station to uncover an underground railroad helping rogue telepaths escape the Psycor. Although Walter Koenig made a real impression as the character in Mind War, a race through dark places that truly crystallises Bester as the arrogant, goose-stepping sleuth fans love to hate. Not only does he believe in the core completely, he also sees telepaths as inherently superior to ordinary humans, and his seething contempt for having to work around those he sees as beneath him radiates from every single word he utters. To him, human beings are merely a means to an end, playthings for him to manipulate so he can achieve his goals. The battle of wits between the crew and Bastard is further complicated by Dr. Franklin being revealed as a key figure in the Underground Railroad, and Talia Winters beginning to question her allegiances. As mentioned before, Talia sees the Psycor, despite its obvious Orwellian and fascistic overtones, as her home. Hardly surprising considering it's literally the only place for telepaths to go without becoming fugitives. Which is why her belief in the core being shaken by the events of Mind War, Spider in the Web and A Race Through Dark Places is so impactful. The fallout of these events are cumulative, forcing the character into a vulnerable place where she can only turn to the least likely of allies. Though more on this later. The real meat of Season 2 begins in the pivotal episode of The Coming of Shadows. During a visit to the station by the Centauri Emperor, Jakar plots to assassinate who he sees as the primary culprit of his people's suffering, and Londo joins with the conniving Lord Rifa to amass more power for themselves. The setup is a powder keg which, when blown, transforms the Babylon 5 universe forever. Central to this episode is the relationship between Jakar and Londo Malare. For fans, this pair are the true main characters of the series, who both embody the narrative themes and philosophical heart of the show. Off-camera, Peter Jurisic and Andreas Katsulas got on like a house on fire, becoming firm friends after only a few weeks of filming. This real-life chemistry translates wonderfully to the screen, even if the characters are more often than not at each other's throats. Over the course of the first two seasons, the show pulls a kind of bait-and-switch with these characters. Initially, Jakar is portrayed as a recurring villain for the series, the architect of several elaborate plots to amass power for himself and his people, which Sinclair and the station crew have to foil on more than one occasion. His innate pomposity and his alien appearance set him up as the brutal alien conqueror familiar to anyone with even a passing familiarity with pulp-era science fiction. Londo Malari, on the other hand, with his over-the-top hairstyle, eccentric accent, and penchant for women and wine, makes him much more likeable and endearing to the audience. Early on, he functions as comic relief in many episodes, 
but this dynamic starts to shift during the first season and is a complete 180 during the second. This change first begins in the aforementioned episode Mind War. The B-plot of the episode concerns Sinclair's lover Catherine Sakai, whose attempt to launch a survey mission of the planet Sigma 957 is shot down by Jakar. Sakai's accusations that Jakar is blocking her mission out of either spite or a desire to exploit the world's resources for the Narn are perfectly in line with his reputation thus far. However, when Jakar later stages a rescue after Sakai runs afoul of an incomprehensibly powerful and ancient alien presence, we see how Jakar may not be the person we thought he was. Instead, he reveals a wiser and philosophical side of himself, which carries with it an unexpected sense of warmth and even kindness. There are things in the universe billions of years older than either of our races. They are vast, timeless, and if they are aware of us at all, it is as little more than ants. That's all you know? Yes. They are a mystery. And I am both terrified and reassured to know that there are still wonders in the universe, that we have not yet explained everything. Londo, meanwhile, though amusing in his mannerisms, also reveals a kind of fanatical nationalistic pride, though pride for a prelapsarian vision of his people. When Mr. Morden posits his signature question, Londo showcases an aspect of his character we hadn't really seen yet. I want my people to reclaim their rightful place in the galaxy. I want to see the Centauri stretch forth their hand again and command the stars. I want us to be what we used to be. I want, I want it all back the way that it was. Although his complicity in the death of Lord Kiro can be viewed as unwitting and his order of the attack on the Narn outpost in Chrysalis as a moment of weakness, his actions in the coming of shadows are impossible to dismiss. When the Centauri Emperor suffers a fatal heart attack, Londo and Rifa see their opportunity to seize power and glory for themselves, and with the help of Mr. Morden's associates, Londo orders a surprise attack on a Narn colony which will plunge both races into war. The scene itself, however, is not Londo's darkest moment of the episode. That comes later when Jakar, not yet aware of the attack, meets Malari and the Zokolo for a drink after learning the Centauri Emperor intended to apologize for the Centauri occupation of Narn. He wanted to say he's sorry. What? He came all the way out here so that he could stand beside a Narn in neutral territory and apologize. The hatred between our people can never end until someone is willing to say, I'm sorry, and try and find a way to make things right again, to atone for our actions. I had... I had no idea. No, I'm sure you didn't. Which is what makes this scene between the two so gut-wrenching, as Londo has to sit and share a drink with Jakar, realising what he has just done. I never thought I would be saying this, Molari, but... to the health of your emperor. To the emperor. And thank you. As the episode comes to a close, the full magnitude of Londo's actions are hammered home, and the status quo of the series is once again changed forever. They have crossed the line we cannot allow them to cross. As a result, two hours ago, my government officially declared war against the Centauri Republic. Our hope for peace is over. We are now at war. This ongoing conflict is what characterises the rest of Season 2, even if much of it plays out in the background of other standalone episodes. A particularly strong example of this is in And Now For A Word. We view a story as an in-universe audience member of Interstellar News, as they air a special report on Babylon 5. It's an episode I've always enjoyed revisiting. In the grand scheme of things, the events depicted are pretty standard fare for the show by this point, however it's the larger story and character implications which add a lot of texture to the proceedings. Moments like host Cynthia Torkman occasionally letting her carefully staged managed persona slip from time to time, the sycophantic jingoism of Senator Quantrell, and the propaganda-level advertisements for the Psychor. 
It all does a brilliant job of fleshing out the established world building and gives us a small glimpse at fun one-off characters. It's the regulars though who are used exceedingly well. The audience having knowledge that ISN doesn't gives every interview a nice bit of subtext. Both Londo and Jakar being guilty of parroting their respective government talking points, Sheridan almost letting slip the real reason the Mimbari surrendered at the Battle of the Line, and Ivanova clearly showing thinly veiled disdain for the mere presence of the reporters. But this sense of winking fun doesn't get in the way of some more substantive character moments, such as Jakar recounting how he joined the Narn Resistance after the death of his father, Dr. Franklin conveying the harsh realities of space travel, and Delenn being confronted by the unintended consequences of her transformation into a half-human. It's an episode which I've also used as an entry point for the series for friends and family, a solid showcase of the world, its characters, and the various stories playing out in Season 2. What directly follows and now for a word is a far more personal and dark story, in the shadow of Zahadum. Sheridan discovers that the mysterious Morden was in fact a crew member on the Icarus, the science vessel which was destroyed in the accident which killed his wife. As he delves deeper for some answers, his investigation prompts Delenn and Kosh to reveal a great threat looming on the horizon. As mentioned earlier, Sheridan, for most of Season 2, nicely embodied the archetype of the chisel-jawed space hero ripped right from the heyday of pulpier science fiction. But here we see a different side of Sheridan. In his pursuit of getting answers out of Morden, Sheridan circumvents regulations and the law, abusing his authority as station commander to get what he wants. But in his desperation, he forces Garibaldi to resign and comes close to compromising the larger plans laid out by Kosh and Delenn. When it's finally revealed the Minbari and Vorlons have been playing a dangerous game of chess to prepare for the coming Shadow War, Sheridan is forced into making a difficult decision. The episode presents Boxliner with a fantastic opportunity to showcase his range as an actor. Although Sheridan may fit the image of a heroic space captain, and the Shadow of Zahadum also shows us how ruthless he can be if something or someone gets in the way of what he wants. While ultimately Sheridan has to let Morden go, we are left with a profound sense of foreboding of the impending conflict, but also uncertainty about our supposed hero as well. An episode which has little or nothing to do with the grander narrative of Babylon 5, but I feel is worth bringing up, is Confessions and Lamentations. Dr. Franklin races to find a cure for a virus which is tearing through the Markeb race like wildfire, and threatens to jump to other species as well. While Babylon 5 tends to avoid the Star Trek style of direct social allegories, the episode being written as a metaphor for the AIDS crisis, the cultural element among the Markab, the virus being seen as a sign of moral corruption, is a crucial component of what makes the story so effective. The substance of the story focuses on the social and political aspects of a pandemic, which don't always get the same amount of thought as the medical side of things. Now, at the time of writing, the COVID-19 pandemic is still ongoing, if hopefully winding down somewhat. And having lived through a pandemic myself, I found confessions and lamentations to be startlingly relevant on a recent rewatch. The complacency and ineptitude of governments, the false machismo of authority figures, the callousness of onlookers, and indeed the emboldened racial discrimination. In some ways, the episode revisits similar themes expressed in Season 1's Believers, only wrought on a much larger scale. The crisis is not a failure of science, but a failure of empathy. Rather than coming together to confront the crisis united, instead groups and individuals frantically look for someone to blame and a reason not to care. And much like Believers, the episode refuses to give the audience the sunshine and roses ending many viewers would expect. The greatest tragedy of this story is that this could have been prevented. This didn't need to happen. Yet despite the extinction of the entire Markab race, the failings which led to the deaths of so many are still to be redressed. Later in the season, during the episode Divided Loyalties, Lita Alexander, Babylon 5's originally assigned telepath, returns to the station warning of a sleeper agent planted by the psi -Core. Running parallel to this thread is the evolving relationship between Ivanova and Talia. It's fairly obvious when viewing the episode, and has been confirmed multiple times since, 
that Ivanova and Talia were meant to be bisexual characters, who end up in a romantic relationship by this episode. However, due to a fear of backlash from conservative viewers and or studio executives, this relationship is never definitively depicted on screen. Which is a shame, because it has all the makings of a very compelling journey for both characters. Ivanova and Talia begin the series on opposite ideological sides concerning the Psycor, while Ivanova sees it as a brutally oppressive and cruel organisation which took her mother from her, Talia views the Corps as her home. As Talia's view of the Psycor changed, she confided in Ivanova, and as is revealed in Divided Loyalties, Ivanova herself is a latent telepath. The creative potential for where this relationship and the associated character arcs could have gone is extremely tantalising. Unfortunately, this potential was never met due to the departure of Andrea Thompson. Thompson, though billed as a series regular, didn't feature in a lot of episodes, and when the character did appear, Talia functioned more as a plot device. Rarely was she the centre of any stories herself, barring a few exceptions. Therefore, Thompson ultimately decided to leave the show on amicable terms. Thus, in spite of a red herring which suggests Ivanova may be the sleeper agent, Talia is revealed as the one Lita is looking for, and she is sent back to the Psycor. It's a solid enough episode, but this ending has always left long-time fans wondering what might have been with these two characters. Returning to the larger political stories of Babylon 5, we eventually come to the end of the Narn Centauri War in The Long Twilight Struggle. As the decimated Narn military launches a last desperate mission to stave off defeat, Londo once again calls on Mr. Morden and his associates for assistance. True to form, Babylon 5 does not give the audience the inspiring story of an underdog triumphing in the face of overwhelming odds. Instead, there is an inevitability to the Narn's defeat, yet somehow this only heightens the tragedy. As we watch the last of the Narn fleet being utterly destroyed by the shadow vessels, we realise that the Narns simply had no chance of ever winning against this kind of power. With the last of their ships gone, the Centauri roll on to the Narn homeworld, further beating an already defeated foe. And watching from one of the ships is Londo, confronted with the reality of what he thought he wanted to see for so many years. Andreas Katsulas delivers a simply heartbreaking performance as Jakar, when he is forced to leave the council chamber. No dictator, no invader, can hold an imprisoned population by force of arms forever. There is no greater power in the universe than the need for freedom. The Centauri learned this lesson once. We will teach it to them again. Though it take a thousand years, we will be free. Following this tragic end to the Narn Centauri War is one of my personal favourite episodes of the entire series, Comes the Inquisitor. To ensure Delenn is ready to be a leader in the coming Shadow War, Caution lists the mysterious Sebastian to put her through a strange and brutal trial which could potentially end her life. The episode's placement in the series is a wise one, having been engrossed in an epic storyline with fleets of spaceships being blown to bits and planets bombed back to the Stone Age, Comes the Inquisitor is a welcome change to a much more contained, personal story. It's wall-to-wall -wall character work, with the Inquisitor interrogating Delenn and eventually Sheridan's very soul. Though Sebastian and the Vorlons clearly operate on a line of logic, it is a logic totally alien to the main characters and the viewer. In a way, it is the Vorlon shadow conflict in microcosm the manipulation of younger, less powerful beings through technologies and for purposes they have little hope of ever truly understanding. While Mira Furlon and Bruce Boxleitner are typically great throughout the episode, it's guest star Wayne Alexander, the titular Inquisitor, who steals the show. He has a clear disdain for seemingly every living thing in existence, but by the end of the episode, we come to understand he is truly angry and disdainful at himself most of all. Much like Mr. Morden, Sebastian feels like a character right out of an old folktale. His totally anachronistic appearance and cryptic line of questioning is further enhanced by the chilling revelation that he is, in fact, Jack the Ripper. 
Ultimately, he's a truly evil being getting exactly what he deserves. He is trapped in servitude to the Vorlons, periodically revived over the centuries to test individuals, demanding they meet a standard he himself never could. In contrast to the larger, grittier setting of Babylon 5, Sebastian's presence is truly weird, but it adds further depth to the universe and builds the mystique of the Vorlons even more. In the grand narrative of Babylon 5, Come the Inquisitor always stands out for me as something totally unique and strange, but utterly compelling. Also true to form, the finale of Babylon 5's second season is another large shake-up to the status quo, with further twists and revelations. Once again, it seems as if the main characters are caught up in events they are too powerless to stop. As the galaxy spirals out of control around them, they come to the realisation that Babylon 5 has failed in its mission, and with the shadows on the horizon, the next year of Babylon 5 would go to darker places than ever before. For Season 3 of Babylon 5, the creative team were effectively given carte blanche to make what they wanted, as from then on Warner Brothers gave no more studio notes. Though this was not a good-natured endorsement of the series, but rather due to, as J. Michael Straczynski put it, benign neglect. Despite being billed as a flagship show for the Primetime Entertainment Network, it seems Warner Brothers decided they had bigger priorities than overseeing Babylon 5. This strange quirk of fate allowed Straczynski and the other producers to be far bolder in their storytelling ambitions, with well over half the season being purely dedicated to the larger arc. Only a handful of episodes can be regarded as truly standalone, with even the B-plots of some of these being integral to the larger narrative. This focus on the central arc also seemed to merit the same focus from the writing team, which for season 3 stopped being a team. Instead, the whole 22-episode season was written entirely by J. Michael Straczynski himself, the first time a single writer had written an entire season of a show in US television history. As well as this change in the writer's room, further changes to the cast also occurred. Patricia Tolman returned to the show, becoming a series regular. The show also added Jason Carter as Marcus Cole. Like many of his co-stars, Jason Carter cut his teeth in theatre, performing on the West End in several acclaimed productions. His first television role was in the BBC children's series Jackanary Playhouse. Thanks to this benign neglect and narrative focus, Season 3 is even stronger than Season 2. With much of the foreshadowing and setup taken care of in the previous two seasons, the show is free in its third year to really kick things up a gear. Huge unexpected twists and turns with the same weight as the fall of the Narn homeworld and character-rich outings like in the Shadow of Zaha Doom abound in Season 3. But despite how much Season 3 leans into the main story arc, there is still a strong set of one-off episodes to enjoy as well. Convictions is a high-octane action thriller which sees a mad bomber hold the station hostage, but probably the most memorable part of the episode is the B-plot, which sees Jakar and Londo trapped in a broken-down elevator. Do you want to live as much as I, hmm? Oh, yes, but I would much rather see you dead. There is also Passing Through Gethsemane, which features a characteristically excellent guest performance from Brad Dourif as a monk haunted by dreams of violent murders. It's an introspective mystery story which tackles difficult moral questions and engenders a great deal of sympathy for a fascinating one-off character. Now I know, Theo. Now I know. And once again, the brilliant Jakar Londo relationship is used to its fullest in the terrific Dust to Dust. I have nothing to say to you! Oh, but there's so much more to see, Molari. How does it feel to be helpless? To be the victim? However, the true watershed moment for the season and the series as a whole comes at the point of no return. Although The Shadow War is Babylon 5's main story arc, I think most fans would agree the far more compelling thread concerns the Earth Alliance and the rise of President Morgan Clark. Ever since the assassination of President Santiago at the end of Season 1, the second and third season quietly build a sense of rising tension which finally breaks in Season 3. What first appears to be an espionage plot soon gives way to a story concerning the rise of a fascist totalitarian regime on Earth. 
With direct inspiration taken from George Orwell's 1984 and references to dark chapters of history like the rise of Nazism and the Red Scare paranoia of McCarthyism, the President Clark story arc is one which hits far closer to home than the more eldritch Lovecraftian threat of the shadows. The brilliance of this arc, though, is how subtly it's woven into the background of the show. The arrival of Nightwatch with its platitudes of fostering a healthy community seems appealing at first, until its personnel start acting more like a secret police force. Two more shop owners have openly criticized presidential decisions. Have you nothing to report? I guess I haven't been thinking in those terms. I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with it. Well, let's make it easy for you, shall we? Can you verify the report about the store owner that I mentioned? He's already been named, so you wouldn't be adding anything new, just confirming what we already know. I guess, uh... I mean, yeah. Yeah, I heard him talking, but, it, but it's just talk. It's... That's fine. And the new ministries created back on Earth reveal themselves as a means of creating propaganda and stamping out dissent. Earth doesn't have homeless... Excuse me? We don't have the problem. Yes, there are some displaced people here and there but they've chosen to be in that position they can't get a job earth gov has promised a job to anyone that wants one so if someone doesn't have a job they must not want one uh, poverty hmm? it's the same crime yes there is some but it's all caused by the mentally unstable and w when exactly did all this happen when we rewrote the dictionary what makes this arc so effective is just how quietly all of the pillars of tyranny fall into place. Though there are attempts at gathering evidence and getting it to the right people, there's an assumption that the system will not fail, that the press will expose the truth, and the courts will exact proper justice. But by the end of the episode of Messages from Earth, it becomes clear the situation is far more dire than originally thought. Although Mr. Morden and the Shadows play a part in President Clark's rise to power, it's also clear that they are merely exploiting attitudes and ambitions which already existed within the Earth Alliance government. And far sooner than anyone was prepared for, this newly installed tyrant flexes his power, declaring martial law and brutally quashing any attempt at organized resistance. With Earth Force ships firing on one another and Star Furies bombing civilian targets, the situation quickly comes to a head in the episode Severed Dreams. Quite possibly the best episode of the entire series, Severed Dreams sees Babylon 5 forced to declare independence from the Earth Alliance and stand its ground against a fleet of ships sent to take over the station. The previous two episodes, Messages from Earth and Point of No Return, were really just the warm-up act to this one. But now all the pieces are in place, Severed Dreams takes on a pace which constantly accelerates until its climax. One particularly strong scene shows the downfall of ISN. Sets and news anchors which have until this point been relegated to background exposition suddenly feel like real people in danger. Putting this twist on such a familiar element of the show is truly effective in shocking the audience. Armed troops have begun moving in on the ISN broadcast center here in Geneva. We just saw them coming around the corner. We're trying to get a camera down there to document what's going on. Listen to me, there's information you don't have. What's been going on for the last year, we haven't been allowed to tell you. We have And with two rogue destroyers headed for Babylon 5, our main characters are finally forced into making the decision they've so desperately wanted to avoid. If it was just us, hey. It pays you money, it takes you chances, but it's not just us. It's a quarter million people here and billions more out there counting on us. If we surrender, they'll court-martial us. If we fight and lose, they'll probably kill us. They probably will at that. So the choice is yours. I say fight. 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 Once the decision is made, there's truly no going back, a fact which is heartbreakingly apparent when Sheridan has to say goodbye to his father. Well, there's a lot going on right now, and I don't know when I'll be able to call again. Son, I see what's going on. I can't imagine the kind of decisions that are going through your mind right now. I'm sure they're not easy. But when push comes to shove, you've always done the right thing. Now, I know you've probably got a million things to do. And I guess, uh, I'll 
I'll talk to you when I talk to you. Goodbye, Dad. The inevitable clash at the end of the episode is a desperate pitched battle with the station and main characters never before being in such danger. With heavy losses on both sides, it all comes down to the wire, with Sheridan and his allies scraping by with a victory, only for Clark's reinforcements to arrive. All seems lost until Delenn, flanked by three Minbari battlecruisers, triumphantly arrives, giving us a well-deserved punch-the-air moment. Only one human captain has ever survived battle with a Minbari fleet. He is behind me. You are in front of me. If you value your lives, be somewhere else. This victory is hard fought, costly, and far from clean, but the main characters emerge on the other side, renewed, secure in their ideals, and ready to face the coming of the shadows. Though the President Clark storyline is far from over, Severed Dreams is its most important chapter. The episode took home multiple awards, including a Hugo for Best Dramatic Presentation, the second time the show managed to win the award, fending off far more popular heavy hitters. Alongside these far-reaching political stories, Season 3 also features some bold and exciting arcs for the characters. One such arc is the beginnings of a possible romance between Marcus and Ivanova. Ivanova has long been a fan-favourite character, and for good reason. Claudia Christian brings a great combination of toughness and gravitas, but also humour and quirkiness. And although the character gets plenty of laughs, Ivanova is also a deeply tragic figure. Ever since Talia's departure, Ivanova effectively ceased having any kind of personal life, being the only surviving member of her family and totally dedicated to her work. Which is what makes Marcus such a ray of sunshine in the character's life. Similarly honourable and headstrong, but with an enjoyable sense of humour and a sharp wit, which thankfully never undercuts the drama of any stories. Initially, their relationship appeared to be platonic, but over the course of the season, it becomes clear the two harbour romantic feelings for one another. While I'm not one for shipping, it's so obvious just how perfect these two are for one another, and the relationship forms a classically engaging will-they-won't-they -they arc for the series. Nuzin Falani and Alice Midron. And what does that mean? It's just a greeting. A darker arc concerns Dr. Franklin's growing addiction to stims. It's a sensitive subject which is handled with great tact and respect in the show, and Richard Biggs and Jerry Doyle both deliver terrific performances throughout, as Franklin and Garibaldi's relationship is tested to the limit. Display the following blood sample tests. Franklin, Stephen, file numbers. Awaiting file numbers for display. No. No, never mind. Abort. Why? Why'd I do it or why didn't I do it? Why didn't you do it? Because on some level you've got to know the truth. The thing about medicine is that it all comes down to the numbers. X amount of stems in your bloodstream proves that you're not addicted. Y amount proves that you are. Reaching its climax in the episode, Shadow Dancing, Franklin's struggle to keep fighting and retake control of his life is given the appropriate emotional weight, as he literally pulls himself out of the gutter and finds solace once again among friends. Later, Season 3 also gave us the two-parter War Without End. By this point, the treatment Michael O'Hare was undergoing for his illness was partially successful, allowing him to make a small cameo in The Coming of Shadows and a guest appearance here. It's extremely gratifying to see Sinclair return and join forces with Sheridan. The episode as a whole is an infectiously fun time travel adventure, with Tim Cote's Zathras also making a welcome return. Zathras understand. No, Zathras not understand, but Zathras do. Zathras good at doings, not understandings. What makes the episode so significant, however, is the denouement to Sinclair's character arc. Sinclair takes Babylon 4 back in time to the first Shadow War, presenting us with the incredible twist that all this time Sinclair was in fact Valen, the greatest warrior and most holy figure in Minbari history. Whether this was always intended to be Sinclair's arc is unclear, but it's a fitting send-off for the character and a touching farewell to Michael O'Hare. Our main characters barely have time to stop for breath, though, with the present Shadow War now in full swing. 
The episode Interludes and Examinations, which actually preceded War Without End, is a critical chapter in this war. However, it also carries with it another tragedy for Londo Malari. Having severed his ties with Mr. Morden and manipulated Lord Reefa into doing the same, Londo awaits the return of Adira, a character from Season 1's Born to the Purple, and possibly the only person Londo ever truly loved, and who truly loved him in return. <laughs> I feel happy. And while Londo was guilty of many terrible things, the layered characterization and nuanced performance from Peter Jurisic still makes you feel for him when Adira is murdered on the transport to Babylon 5. Who is that? I'm sorry, this isn't. I said, who is that? Her name is Adira Tari. <laughs> Londo. <laughs> The episode also features Sheridan's showdown with Kosh. After trying to convince the Vorlons to fight the Shadows directly and being met with more riddles and obfuscations, Sheridan finally has enough. Unless your people get off their encounter suited butts and do something, I've got nothing to lose! How many more? How many more, Kosh? How many more dead before you're satisfied, huh? Maybe one more death. Well, balance out the books. Oh. The brief moment of gratification in seeing the Vorlons going head to head with the Shadows is soon undermined by Kosh's shocking death at the hands of Mr. Morden's associates. Of all the characters in Babylon 5's ensemble, Kosh was naturally the most difficult to figure out, being the most alien. However, thanks to his iconic design and cryptic dialogue, he could be just as compelling as the others. Kosh was certainly responsible for some morally questionable acts, and though the character is almost impossible to read emotionally, by the time he reaches his end, it becomes clear in his own way that he really did care about Sheridan and his crew. Despite the character's impenetrable shell and unreadable emotions, Kosh's demise is still extremely moving, Kosh appearing to Sheridan in a dream at the moment of his death, symbolised by Sheridan's own father. I wish I could have done more for you. Uh, there's so much I should have said, and now it's too late. Uh, You've got to go now, John. No, no, don't, don't leave. It's, it's all right, son. See, as long as you're here, I'll always be here. A far more deserving fate meets the conniving Lord Rifa, however, when Londo outwits his rival of Narn with the begrudging help of Jakar. Although we as viewers already know the death of Londo's true love Adira was instigated by Morden and not Rifa, seeing Rifa meet his just deserts still satisfies. After a solid victory against the Shadows, a momentary reprieve in the conflict leads to another startling twist when Sheridan's supposedly deceased wife Anna suddenly arrives on the station. Central to the arising conflict is the romance between Sheridan and Delenn. Now truth be told, the love story between these two has never been one of my favourite parts of the show. That's not to say it's bad, but the way it develops feels sometimes at odds with the larger tone of the series. As mentioned before, Babylon 5's world building was consciously made to feel more grounded and true to life than the optimistic near utopian future scene in Star Trek. However, the larger thematic influences on the show are much more ancient and mythological, drawing from biblical stories and Arthurian legend in particular. In fact, J. Michael Straczynski often likened Sheridan and Delenn to King Arthur and Guinevere. Thus, the romance between the two characters takes on a kind of chivalrous traditionalism, grand gestures and swooping melodrama as opposed to the crusty banter or fun chemistry seen in the likes of Ivanova and Marcus or Sinclair and Sakai. The sheridan Delenn relationship works on paper and is very well acted, but tonally it does stick out. That being said, that unrelenting emotional sincerity only enhances the drama in the season 3 finale, Zaha Doom. Seeing Sheridan, a man who wears his heart on his sleeve, torn between the memory of his love for Anna and his present love for Delenn, really engenders a lot of sympathy for the character. But while we have sympathy for Sheridan, our suspicion of Anna only grows. Walking into what is most certainly a trap, 
Sheridan finally understands the conflict between the Vorlons and the Shadows as a conflict between order and chaos. The Shadows essentially believing in a kind of social Darwinism, from their point of view helping the races of the galaxy by ensuring only the strongest and smartest survive. Whereas the Vorlons impose their order, manipulating the younger races to see them as natural leaders or even gods. Despite the pleasantries of the Shadows, when it becomes clear they have no intention of letting Sheridan leave of his own accord, he springs his own trap. Intercut with Sheridan's goodbye message to Delenn back on the station, emotions run high as Sheridan meets his end in a desperate but daring strike at the heart of the Shadow homeworld. And I want you to know that I love you, Delenn. Goodbye. Not since the cliffhanger to Star Trek The Next Generation's Best of Both Worlds have the stakes in sci-fi television been so high and the future of the series so uncertain. Season 3 had been an enormous success for Babylon 5. Many fans argued the third year is in fact Babylon 5 at its height, and it's easy to see why. Not only had it successfully carved out its own space in pop culture, running alongside the ever-dominant Star Trek, the high quality of the stories also wanted widespread critical acclaim and eternal devotion from a small but extremely loyal fanbase. The franchise had also begun to expand beyond the confines of television, with a line of official tie-in novels and comic books. But in spite of the success, the future of the series was suddenly on shaky ground. The primetime entertainment network, Babylon 5's home network was well on its way to shuttering. Corporate reshuffling and contractual disputes saw the network lose a huge chunk of its financial support and miss out on the revenue from many of its shows. By 1997, the writing was on the wall for PTEN, and it seemed the same was true of Babylon 5. Having originally taken five years to find a home on Warner Brothers, and with low, albeit consistent, ratings, the prospect of another network picking up Babylon 5 was pretty much a pipe dream. Thus, season four of Babylon 5 would likely be its last. Not wanting to see the show end on a cliffhanger, J. Michael Straczynski decided to reshuffle his plans for the series, bringing a number of storylines originally planned for the fifth season forward into season four. As a result, Season 4 features no standalone episodes with self-contained adventures. Instead, all 22 episodes, once again written solely by Straczynski, are purely dedicated to the main story arcs of the show. This gives Season 4 of Babylon 5 an unrelenting fast pace, with a palpable dramatic tension which never lets up until the end of the season. This is also reflected in the new arrangement for the theme tune, which is my personal favourite version. When this fast pace excels and where it falters is something we'll discuss later, but first Babylon 5 had to carry on after the apparent death of Captain Sheridan and the disappearance of Mr. Garibaldi. The conclusion of the Shadow War is something some fans consider to be quite rushed, resulting from Straczynski having to bring several storylines forward. However, I personally disagree with this assessment. The first six episodes of the season are indeed packed, but this overstuffing of twists, double crosses, and space battles feels quite justified and features some of the best moments in the whole series. While I'm generally against bringing characters back from the dead, Sheridan's return from Zaha Doom leads us into exploring some fascinating ideas. This exploration is largely facilitated by the character Lorian, once again another excellent performance from Wayne Alexander. Just as the show had pondered the existence of a soul in life after death, the possibility of Sheridan coming back from the dead is a matter of will rather than biology. The two-hander scenes between these two characters feel like something from a stage play, and just like Sheridan's initial demise, the climax of this sequence proves to be quite moving. It's getting dark. 
Parker. I know. Your close friend. It's easy to find something worth dying for. Do you have anything worth living for? I cannot create life, but I can breathe on the remaining embers. It may not work, but I can hope. Hope is all we have. Do you have anything worth living for? Sleep now. I will watch and catch you if you should fall. Meanwhile, Londo and Jakar once again steal the show with their own plotline on Centauri Prime. Central to this plotline is the Centauri Emperor Cartagia. Inspired by the infamous Roman Emperor Caligula, Cartagia at first seems to be merely a spoiled aristocrat, installed sometime in Season 2, presumably to be Lord Reefa's puppet. However, the character is soon revealed as a sadistic, raving lunatic. Guest star Robert Krimmer is clearly having a blast playing the role, feasting on the scenery around him. The character would be highly amusing if he wasn't also completely terrifying. His casual violence is one thing, but his self-obsession and narcissism is what makes him so dangerous. He is so consumed by his own ego, his quest for godhood threatens to destroy Centauri Prime itself. You and I, Volare, we will turn Centauri Prime into an inauguration pyre to commemorate my ascension into godhood. The fire of our world will light my way. If I become a god, how will our world survive without me? Let it burn, Malari. Let it all end in fire. With everyone else in the Centaurum too afraid to move against Cartagia, Jakar becomes the only person Londo can turn to. Jakar must play a crucial role in Cartagia's assassination, but in return, Jakar demands Malari free his homeworld from Centauri occupation. In a fitting piece of dramatic irony, these two bitter enemies are also each other's only hope. In a further bit of dramatic irony, when the time comes, it is Veer, not Londo, who ousts Cartagia. Stephen First is a delight from his very first appearance on the show and becomes a critical component of Londo Malari's tragic rise to power. First's expert comedic timing and Veer's wonderful eccentricities cement him as solid comic relief, but also as the walking embodiment of Londo's conscience, the innocence he lost along the way. Therefore, Londo comforting a guilt-ridden Veer following Cartagia's assassination is simultaneously cathartic and also deeply tragic. Don't you understand it? I've never done anything like this before. I close my eyes and I always see his face. Don't you know that all I ever wanted was just a good job? Small title, nothing fancy. I never wanted to be here. I never wanted to know the things that I know or to do. I know. I know, Veer. I remember when you first arrived on Babylon 5. You were so... full of life, innocent. I was not kind to you. I think that I did that because I was envious of you. Envious that you had come so far and were still... innocent. You did a hard thing. But you still have your heart, and your heart is a good one. Though Londo's conspiracy against Cartagia is successful, he is further heartbroken when he finally discovers it was Morden, not Rifa, who had Adira killed. <laughs> And in his fit of rage and grief, he takes his revenge. Seeing Lord Reefa get what was coming to him was one thing, but Mr. Morden, after strolling through the galaxy completely untouchable, finally facing the consequences of his actions, is monumentally satisfying. Even if my associates lose this war, they have allies! They'll make sure Centauri Prime pays the price for what you've done here today! What I have done. Oh, Mr. Morden, I have not even started with you yet. 
The final showdown between the Vorlons and Shadows, with the younger races caught in between, threatens to get out of hand with its absurdly epic scale. Thankfully, the conflict is not resolved with some super weapon or Death Star like weakness, but instead by interrogating and resolving the respective ideologies of both sides. The central questions who are you and what do you want finally being turned around on these two races. The Vorlons ask only one question over and over. Who are you? And you, for you the question is, what do you want? I have never heard you answer that question. You don't know, do you? You've been fighting each other so long, you've forgotten. This is where our main characters truly seize their own destinies. For so long they've been caught up in events far out of their control, seemingly pulled along by the force of history. But finally, after so many lives lost and worlds destroyed, the Vorlons and the Shadows have outlived their usefulness and retreat forever beyond the rim of the galaxy. Our age is past. This belongs to the younger races now. Will you come with us? I will not leave you now. I will go with you beyond the rim." It may not have been the ending so many fans were expecting, but it's certainly the right ending. Now in a new age of their respective civilizations, the rest of Season 4 turns its focus closer to home. Following such a stunning victory against all odds, Delenn becomes entangled in a Minbari civil war, which sees the warrior cast attempting a takeover of the Minbari homeworld. The Minbari have always been one of my favourite factions in Babylon 5, though the criticism that they are boring is an understandable one. They lack the passion of the other races and the personal struggles which an audience could relate to. However, this criticism, while understandable, is part of the point. The Minbari are essentially a dying race, a civilization which has largely stagnated, becoming too bogged down in tradition and making efforts to remain isolated from the rest of the galaxy. Which is why the Minbari storyline in Season 4 has so much impact, because for once the Minbari undergo some real change. Delenn, by comparison, has undergone massive changes throughout the series. Not just her physical transformation, but her personal transformation as well. Despite how ruthless the character was in The Gathering, Delenn in Season 1 is quite reserved, slightly naive, and even timid. But having been bandied about by the Grey Council for so long, Delenn found a depth of courage and strength of will which grows over the course of the third and fourth seasons. She goes from being paralysed by fear at the mere sight of a shadow vessel, to leading the charge against a fleet of Drac ships herself. And Season 4 sees even more drastic changes for Delenn and the Minbari as a whole. Not only do we learn Delenn is in fact a direct descendant of Valen, aka Geoffrey Sinclair, but the conclusion of the Civil War sees the formation of a new Grey Council and the balance of Minbari society changed forever. Meanwhile, Garibaldi's arc serves to unsettle and intrigue the viewer. Having returned from his disappearance at the end of Season 3, Garibaldi suddenly resigns from his post and starts acting quite antagonistically towards Sheridan. The writing for this arc is a nice bit of sleight of hand. Although Garibaldi's resignation as Chief of Security is abrupt, his reasoning for doing so does track. And although Sheridan is our hero, Garibaldi being wary of a growing cult of personality around him is also also understandable. However, a few key flashbacks and what appear to be subliminal messages cause us to question what's really happening with the character. Yet, at the same time, the manipulation isn't so obvious that the character loses all his agency. There's definitely some truth to Garibaldi's words and actions, but it's uncertain just how much. What characterises the rest of Season 4, however, is the rising conflict with Earth and President Clark. Echoing Season 2's And Now for a Word, the illusion of truth sees a team of ISN reporters sneak aboard the station to make a story. Even though ISN has been transformed into a propaganda tool for Clark, the ISN team promised the crew they will do their best to show the Earth Alliance Babylon 5 side of the story where they can. A promise which turns out to be worthless when the final broadcast is another propaganda instrument for the Clark regime. But this time, because the viewer is privy to the production of the report, we can see exactly how the news team manipulated the footage into peddling more lies. And it's this broadcast which prompts more active involvement in the resistance from the Babylon 5 crew. For one thing, they create counter-programming to the propaganda, presented by Ivanova. 
Running parallel to this is Marcus and Dr. Franklin smuggling themselves to Mars to make contact with the Resistance. For me, this is where Franklin truly shines. He feels like a surprisingly natural fit for some espionage. He and Marcus make a fun odd couple, and the Mars Resistance are a compelling set of characters all on their own. In spite of these efforts though, it becomes clear the Clark regime won't go down without a fight. After Clark's orders lead to the slaughter of over 10,000 civilians, Sheridan decides enough is enough and moves to attack Clark's forces directly. Echoing the tension and high stakes of severed dreams, the conflict is far from easy and the fighting is far from clean. Although Sheridan more often than not commands the superior forces, the effort to preserve life as much as possible makes every battle a struggle and the cost of victory high. Meanwhile, as Sheridan, Ivanova and the others campaign across space, the true purpose of Garibaldi's threat reveals itself. Employed by William Burgess, one of the richest men in the Earth Alliance, Garibaldi discovers Burgess's plot to develop a selective virus which only targets telepaths. An insurance policy to keep the Psy Corps, who are quickly amassing more power in response to Sheridan's campaign, in check. This leads Garibaldi to truly his darkest moment, where he is forced to betray his former commanding officer and friend in order to keep the Psy Corps at bay. Only for all this effort to be in vain, when Bester is revealed as Garibaldi's puppet master, his leaving Babylon 5, joining Burgess, all a grand manipulation to uncover Burgess's viral weapon and capture it before it can be used. The following episode, Intersections in Real Time, was originally intended to be the season 4 finale. It's been likened to the acclaimed Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Chain of Command. It sees Sheridan in captivity, physically abused and psychologically manipulated by his interrogator, a man simply named William. The Orwellian overtones are at their most prominent here. William's assertion is that the truth is fluid, able to be bent into any shape, is given credence thanks to his manipulation of the environment and obvious lies stated alongside solid facts. Bruce Boxleitner and guest star Ray Burke both deliver outstanding performances. When you were a soldier, you fought the Minbari. The Minbari were the enemy. That was the truth. And then one day someone said the Minbari are no longer the enemy. And that was the truth. It's not the way. You swore an oath to Earth Force because you believed in it. That was the truth. Now Earth Force is supposed to be the enemy. Now that is the truth. The truth is fluid. The truth is subjective. No! Governments make policy. Soldiers have to accept those policies even when they're completely contradictory. It's the very definition of your job. There truly is nothing to go on with William as a character. In all likelihood, everything he tells Sheridan about himself and his motivations are a lie. But the deception is only part of the intended manipulation. Rather, the true goal of the interrogator is to unshackle Sheridan completely from his sense of reality, so he can be moulded into a mouthpiece for Clark's regime. And unlike Jean-Luc Picard in Chain of Command, Sheridan never gets the opportunity to land any hits in this verbal joust. Instead, he is sustained by willpower alone, which is partly what makes the ending seem so cruel. Even after Sheridan has readied himself for death and remained defiant to his last breath, he isn't even permitted an execution to end his suffering. Towards the end of the season is where that unrelenting pace starts to hurt some of the plotting, however. Garibaldi manages to win back the trust of his friends and affect Sheridan's rescue in only a single episode. Logically, the events track, but it all feels a tad rushed. Thankfully, the final push to Earth doesn't have the same problem. While Sheridan leading the charge in command of his old ship and Clark's downfall are satisfyingly triumphant, the emotional impact accompanies Marcus and Ivanova. After being ambushed by a fleet of prototype destroyers, Ivanova is mortally wounded and not expected to survive. In a fit of desperation, Marcus sacrifices himself to save Ivanova's life in an utterly heartbreaking end to the episode. I love you. It's heartbreak which is extended into the following episode when we see Ivanova traumatized and guilt-stricken over Marcus's sacrifice. Claudia Christian's acting in this scene is simply devastating to watch. Here was Marcus. I knew he'd never hurt me. And I knew he'd never leave me. And I knew he loved me. I knew it. 
And he gave so much and he wanted so little in return. He just wanted a kind word or, or a smile. And all I ever gave him in two years was grief. The rest of this penultimate episode, Rising Star, acts as a well-told, if again slightly rushed, wrap-up for the season. Rather than Sheridan's forces sweeping in, saving the day, and being unequivocally celebrated, instead the episode makes a real go of examining the consequences of his actions. As with the fighting which preceded it, this isn't a clean victory. And although Sheridan is forced to resign from Earth Force, Delenn, Londo, and Jakar instigating the formation of the Interstellar Alliance bodes well for the future. It isn't quite a Sunshine and Roses ending, but it does leave the viewer with a sense of hope. And while Rising Star seems like the logical, definitive ending for the series, Babylon 5 goes one step further with the Season 4 finale, The Deconstruction of Falling Stars. Far in the future, an unknown figure watches historical records chronicling the centuries after the formation of the Interstellar Alliance. It's a brilliant attempt at doing Babylon 5's own spin on stories like Olaf Stapleton's Last and First Men. There is no definitive ending to the story of Babylon 5, and indeed many of the institutions Sheridan, Delenn, and the others worked so hard to create don't last. But the larger thematic statement of the episode is that the lives of individuals can have a lasting impact on the larger universe. That anyone can make a difference, no matter the grand scope of history. That being said, it seemed at the time that this is where the story of Babylon 5, the show, did end. As production of Season 4 was coming to an end, the cast and crew were readying themselves to say goodbye to the series. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, Turner Network Television approached the creative team with a tantalizing offer. A renewal for a fifth season, along with potential for standalone movies and future spin-offs. It was an offer which couldn't be refused. The resulting era of the franchise would prove to be one of the most turbulent behind the scenes and one of the most controversial for fans. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper. How can it be unauthorized? According to Earth's central records, he is supposed to be dead. Can a dead man object? <laughs>